This next uh, lecture is about input data prerequisites. So we're going to talk about what kinds of data do you need for a flow frequency analysis that you're going to develop in RMC Best Fit, and what kind of pre-processing do you need to do to that data so that it's in the right format um, to use for the analysis. So in this lecture, the learning objectives will be um, we're going to give some examples of prerequisite data and how to pre-process that data. We're going to explain how unregulated data, critical duration, peak to volume ratio, and inflow volume information are used within RMC Best Fit. And we're going to provide some examples of how uncertainty is handled. So um, some of those questions that are are burning um, may be answered in this slide deck, but we also have another presentation about specifically input data. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite topics um, because I wrote the manual uh, that goes with it. Um, so um, it's, um, looks like maybe that picture got a little bit off the page, but um, a prerequisite for performing flood hazard analysis is obtaining an unregulated inflow period of d record data set. So this is, um, I have, this topic comes up a lot in flow frequency analysis. Do I really have to use unregulated data? You say I do, but do I really have to? And the answer is, yes, please, you, you do need to use unregulated data sets. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. Um, many locations have upstream regulation which can significantly affect annual maximum flows and volumes. And many locations also have relatively short periods of record length which means that the volume frequency curves need to be extrapolated to rare annual exceedance probabilities for risk assessments. When analytical frequency curves such as log Pearson type 3 are fit to regulated data, the impacts of regulation can be very dramatic, especially for the extrapolated portion of the curve, resulting in significant over or underestimation of the risk. And that is a big deal, and that's the reason why it's so important. When there's upstream regulation, you will need to assess whether the regulation effects are appreciable, and if the effects are appreciable, perform analysis to remove the effects of regulation from the flow or volume data. An example of the appreciable of appreciable regulation can be seen in the figure. The red series is the annual maximum flow data with upstream regulation, and the blue series is the unregulated inflow data. So I'm talking about the points right now. That's the annual maximum series for the unregulated versus regulated data. Frequency curves were computed for both annual maximum series, shown in the red and blue curves, respectively. You can visually see that the blue curve provides a better overall fit to the data and a more credible extrapolation in the rare annual exceedance probabilities. The main things to keep in mind are that unregulated flow or volume data should typically be used for flow frequency analysis. Using regulated data can over or underestimate the risk. It's important to assess whether upstream regulation has an appreciable effect on the data. Unregulated data sets should be developed when regulation effects are significant. So the manual or the methodology document goes through several examples that show um, examples when there is significant uh, regulation and we need to remove those effects. And then also examples of when, even though there is regulation upstream, significant regulation, um, it actually turns out that those effects are not significant in our data set, and so we don't need to remove them. So in the manual, there's an example of, um, I think there's like 25 upstream dams or something like that, and but they're NRCS dams, and they fill and spill at the 100-year, and so um, they aren't significantly impacting our inflow at the dam that we're interested in in that example, and so we don't need to remove the effects, even though there we know that there are a lot of dams upstream. So um, anyway, you can the information on where to get that is it's on the RMC website, and if you're interested, I can show you where that is. So um, regulation also can change over time, so that's something to be thinking about, um, and remember that your data needs to be homogenous which means that we should not combine records of regulated data and records that are unregulated data together in the same data set. So um, it's important that we have, um, you know, that we consider that when we're developing our inflow data set. And as always, engineering judgment will be required for this type of exercise. Okay, so estimate critical duration. 
to perform a volume frequency analysis, a prerequisite is estimating the critical inflow volume duration. The critical inflow volume duration for a reservoir is typically the inflow duration needed to obtain the peak water surface elevation for the reservoir and is related to the typical duration of inflow hydrographs. The critical duration can vary depending on the characteristics of the watershed and the dam along with the type and magnitude of the flood. For example, snowmelt driven floods typically have longer critical durations than rainfall driven floods. We typically are interested in modeling extreme floods, which will usually have a relatively short critical duration. In the graphic shown, the blue line displays the inflow hydrograph, the red line shows the outflow hydrograph, and the green line shows the pool elevation hydrograph. Notice that the peak stage will always occur at the point where the inflow and the outflow hydrographs intersect. So that's kind of an interesting thing if you didn't know that already. I thought it was interesting when I learned it the first time. Um, small to medium sized watersheds typically have critical durations that are on the order of days. So like one to three days usually. Larger watersheds and snow melt driven watersheds typically have critical durations that are in the order of weeks to months. So a project I'm working on right now has a critical duration of 66 days for a snow melt. It's a very large watershed and it's snow melt driven. So just to give you some perspective, a lot of the ones that we work with are small watersheds that are rainstorm driven and one to three days is typical and then versus 66 days. <laughs> so there's a, you know, it really depends on the, the flood mechanism in your watershed. Okay, since, oh yes, go ahead. Yep, the peak of the, yep, I'll go back one slide. So where the inflow and the outflow hydrographs intersect is where you're gonna see your peak pool. Yep, it's a good question. Um, so let's talk a little bit about estimating critical duration. Estimating critical, or excuse me, critical duration can vary, and so a good, practice is to select a handful of the largest flood events that have occurred in your basin and identify a typical or average critical duration. As you examine the inflow, outflow, and reservoir stage hydrographs, you'll need to use engineering judgment to visually assess the duration that it takes from the beginning of an individual inflow event to the peak reservoir stage. Since the selected critical duration will be a whole number um, or an integer, precise estimates are not typically needed. So we're not gonna use like a decimal point basically is the, is the point there. We love to be precise as engineers, but this is a case where we're gonna round to the whole number. In this example, critical inflow duration was evaluated for six large floods. So there's the table there with all the, the floods recorded, um, but only four of the graphics are included because they fit on the slide. So <laughs> uh, the events range from two to four days in length and the average of these durations was 2.9 days. So for this dam, the selected critical inflow duration was three days. And um, just this is a side note, but I would recommend that whenever you are writing your documentation up, that you specifically say which critical duration you adopted, um, because I find that's a, for some reason, that's something that gets left out of reports a lot of times. Um, so that's just a, from reviewing a lot of reports. That's just a, a side tip that I'd share with you. Okay, a common mistake is to confuse critical inflow duration with PMP duration. So while a critical, a typical PMP duration based on the current hydrometeorological reports or HMRs is 72 hours or three days, that does not mean that the critical inflow duration is gonna be the same length. So for example, as seen in this example, Prado Dam, the, PM, excuse me, the PMP duration is 72 hours, as you can see here. However, the critical inflow duration for Prado Dam is only one day. So um, that's just something to underscore. A lot of times that gets confused. Um, so, and in our documentation, it's important that we write down clearly which duration it is we're talking about. So in this presentation, we're talking about critical inflow duration. Okay, available data is often stored as daily average or sub-daily, for example, hourly values. Inflow volumes typically need to be calculated for the critical duration from the available data, and the inflow volume is calculated as an average flow rate over a length of time equal to the critical duration. We are typically interested in the minimum volume for a given event or a given time period, for example, the annual maximum. <clears throat> 
The first step is to calculate um, the moving average in this example, a four day moving average is calculated given the daily average flow value. The second step is to identify the maximum four day value for the event uh, over the time period of interest. So we'll get into some practical calculating volumes during our workshops um, a little bit later on in the day. Remember that volumes are typically reported as both the duration and the units of flow. So like four days, and then our units would be CFS. Um, in this example, the estimated maximum four day volume is about 70,000 CFS, which means that for any given four day period during the months of April and May, the maximum average flow was 70,000 CFS. There are many ways to calculate volumes. Some use a software tools, including HEC SSP and HEC DSS volumes uh, can be used to calculate volumes. And we can also calculate volumes using a spreadsheet like a Microsoft Excel. So we'll use that technique um, in one of our hands-on workshops. Okay, so let's talk about peak to volume ratio now. Historic flood data are typically reported and documented as peak instantaneous flow estimates. In order to use the historic information in our flood hazard analysis, we need to estimate a corresponding volume for the critical duration. A common way to do this is to estimate a peak to volume ratio based on observed hydrographs. For example, let's say that you have a watershed with a critical duration of three days. One of the observed inflow hydrographs has an instantaneous peak of 44,000 CFS, and it has a maximum three-day average volume of 19,000 CFS. For this example, the peak to volume ratio would be the maximum instantaneous flow divided by the maximum three-day volume, so the peak to volume ratio would be 2.3. The process should typically be done for several observed hydrographs to obtain an average estimate of the peak to volume ratio. Once we estimate a peak to volume ratio, it can then be applied to historic flood events. Let's say that we have a historic flood event that has a peak discharge of 65,000 CFS. Using our peak to volume ratio of 2.3, the corresponding three-day volume estimate for the historic flood event would be 28,300 CFS. We'll get, in, we'll get in some practice on estimating a peak to volume ratio in one of our workshops. Yes. Oh, I was hoping somebody would ask. I was waiting. I get that question every single time we teach this class. So I actually have um, uh, an example that I'm going to share with you tomorrow during our daily review. Um, and I'll just very briefly explain. So um, we in hydrology use the units of CFS for volume instead of acre feet or some other um, unit of volume that you're used to using in other types of science or engineering fields. Um, but we use CFS and one of the primary reasons is because it allows us to discuss volume and flow on the same plot. And that's pretty important for us to be able to do. Um, and we'll show you how to calculate volume using a spreadsheet um, and I'll compare this method that's described which is the moving average method um, with the rectangle rule. Um, and estimating the volume underneath a hydrograph and show you that you get basically the same answer. So um, we'll, hopefully that will help um, seeing the spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet will be um, one of the uh, supplemental resources that you could have downloaded. I, I'm not sure if it was in there. Um, Darcy was the spreadsheet. Those two spreadsheets, were they included in their downloads, student downloads? Okay, so they should be in your downloads that you um, got down from the RMC training website. Okay, so let's talk about uncertainty. So this question came up a little bit earlier. Um, how do we determine what those ranges of flows um, are um, for some historic flood event or, or some event that we have a little bit of uncertainty about? So when we have historic and paleo flood estimates, we typically have pretty large uncertainty that we should include in our flood hazard analysis. In RMC Best Fit, we can input a range of flows to describe the uncertainty in our estimate for a, fl a flood event. A reasonable rule of thumb to assume is plus or minus 20% uncertainty around our best estimate. This is loosely based on the USGS standards for discharge measurement errors uh, for an estimate that would be expected to have a really relatively high uncertainty. 
Engineering judgment can also be used or a formal quantitative uncertainty analysis can be done considering all the sources of uncertainty, which might include uncertainty in the peak stage estimate, uncertainty in our hydraulic model that was used to, to estimate discharge for a given peak stage or the uncertainty in our estimation of the volume from a peak flow. So there's, yeah, as, as you know, there's lots of <laughs> sources for uncertainty in hydrology. Um, so this just, this gives us a nice rule of thumb if we aren't, um, if we don't have another reason to use a different number or range of flows. Regardless of the method used, it's important that the amount of uncertainty makes sense in the context of the available information. And as with many things, development of flow intervals requires judgment. So you'll hear me say that several times during this presentation, but that's the nature of, the nature of our jobs. Okay, so for additional information on developing the input data that's needed for volume frequency analysis, there are several risk management center technical references. Um, so this first one, I mentioned this one before, RMCTR 2018-03, an inflow volume based approach to estimating stage frequency for dams is a great reference and it can be found on the RMC website at the link that's shown there. Um, and then if you want to read a little bit more about how to handle upstream regulation, um, you can refer to this um, other document here that is RMC TR 2001-02, estimating flood hazard for dams with levees, with dams and levees that have upstream regulation. 